So, the next problem is that sometimes you cannot translate updates uniquely. So, this is a particular problem with join views. So, here is a view instructor info which joins instructor with department. So, what is the point of joining this? Because we want not only the ID and the name of the instructor, we want to know which department they are in. Again, in this view of the world, uh, instructors are in one department, departments are in one building. It may not be realistic, but we are keeping our life simple. And it is often useful to show the department, uh, sorry, the building in which a person is working along with uh, other information about the person. So, this view can be pretty useful. So, we have instructor info. Now, supposing we insert into instructor info the same uh, kind of values id, uh, name, and this time there is no department. We had id, name, and building. So, we added a building tailor. Tailor is a name of a building, uh, and white is the name of the instructor. So, this is what we wanted to insert into this view instructor info. But how do we translate this into inserts on the underlying relation? What if there are multiple departments in the Taylor building? What can we do? Supposing the music department is the Taylor building, but also the history department. We can insert this instructor in the history department, and uh, then this update will happen successfully. But the music department is also in Taylor, so we could have even made this instructor in the music department. Note that the view does not have the department name. So, we can cook up the department name, um, but there are two problems. A, how do you cook up a name? You know, uh, so, in this case, there are many ways of cooking up a name, uh, a department, uh, and we do not know how to choose between them. Even if it is unique, does it make any semantic sense to just cook up a department? Okay, so, that is not good. So, in general, you do not want to allow this. In fact, it can become worse if there is no department in the Taylor building. Then, not only do you have to create a department name for this new instructor, we also have to create a new department and put it in the Taylor building. All this, this is totally arbitrary. I mean, this is idiotic to say the least. So, obviously, you cannot do this. And so, most SQL implementations will only allow updates on simple views, which are on a single relation, no joins. As you can see, joins cause immediate problems. Um, the select clause only contains attribute names, does not have expressions, aggregates, distinct and so on. All these cause problems. Any attribute not listed in the select clause can be set to null or, or it can have a default value. The query should not have group by or having clause. These also cause trouble. So, very simple queries, uh, very simple view definitions rather are the only things which SQL implementation will allow updates on. And in fact, there is uh, another issue related. Uh, so, take this query. Create view history instructors as select star from instructor where department name is history. So, this view contains only history instructors. But note that the uh, view uh, in this case does have a department name. But so, supposing we do the following. We insert some ID, name, department biology, salary 100,000 into history instructors. Is this possible? You know, this is a selection on instructor. So, we could actually insert this same tuple directly into instructor, not a problem. But then the view requires department to be history. So, if you check the tuple, it does not satisfy department name history. So, there is no way to insert this tuple into this particular view, it is impossible. So, uh, this can lead to trouble. And in fact, what happened is that this particular view definition actually satisfies the conditions that we have here. It does, it is a single relation, it has only attribute names, no expressions, uh, it, uh, all the attributes are specified in the select clause, there is no grouping or having clause, everything here is satisfied, but still this particular insert makes no sense on this particular view, because it cannot appear in the view result. So, the SQL standards people realized this and then they created more complex rules. Uh, you know, they went crazy on this and they said that you can specify a view definition as updatable with checks of this sort, which will check that if 
there is a selection condition, the inserted tuple matches the selection condition. If not, it's not inserted. But they also allow you to turn off that check, which means it'll uh, if you have the check off, this will be allowed and it will result in an ins insert into the instructor relation, which is rather idiotic. So anyway, SQL uh, lets you do many things. I don't know if implementations actually support all this, but the standard gives all kinds of features. So uh, here's a quiz question. Uh, many people chose option B, which says can be done by a simple insert to instructor. So let me reiterate. Yes, you can insert into instructor, but the insert into the view will not succeed in the sense that that tuple which you inserted in the view will not appear in the view result. If you you know look at the contents of the view after the insert, the tuple is still not there. So you are not successfully inserted it into the view. Yes, you can insert into the uh, instructor relation, but it does not succeed in logically inserting it into the view. So the correct answer is it cannot be done. But I can see why many people chose option B. Uh, it can be uh, misleading in, in the sense that yes, you can do an update to instructor, but no, that does not give you the effect that you wanted, which is to insert this person into history instructor. Okay, so let's move forward. Uh, there are a few more topics. I'll cover a few of these before the break. Uh, the first is uh, the notion of transaction which is a unit of work. We are going to look at this in a lot more detail in uh, the uh, database internals part. But at this point, I just want to deal with it from an external viewpoint. A transaction is just a unit of work. And an atomic transaction either executes fully or is whatever it did is undone. And the net result is as if it never executed. So why is this relevant? Because a transaction may perform multiple updates. and Sometimes if it does one of the updates but not another, the final state of the database will be inconsistent. So you want either all the updates should occur or none of the updates should occur. So how do you specify this in SQL? That's all that we are going to look at at this point. Uh, there are other issues of isolation from concurrent transactions and so on. We'll look at it in more detail. But in the SQL standard, the transactions begin implicitly and are ended by executing a commit work or roll backward. That's what the standard says. In reality, nobody follows the standard as such. What happens by default is that every single SQL statement which you execute executes fully and commits. Now, supposing an SQL statement had to insert five tuples, what is guaranteed is that it won't fail in the middle, leaving two tuples inserted and three tuples not inserted. That can will not happen. Either that whole insert statement will succeed or any partial update it did in case there was a failure will be cleaned up and it will be as if it never executed. So the default of uh, setup in most databases is a single SQL query is a transaction by itself, but multiple SQL queries are each separate transaction on their own. So if you write two SQL updates, insert into R and then insert into S. The database may fail after the insert into R and before the insert into S. And then if you recover the database after a failure, you will find the inserts to R but not of S. So your original goal, which was to update both R and S has failed. And the database may be inconsistent as far as you're concerned. So what do you do about it? Uh, you can turn off auto commit um, using uh, the, the database uh, connection. There's an option for it. And in SQL 99, you can use a syntax called begin atomic end, which unfortunately nobody supports. Uh, but there are small variants of, of this, which PostgreSQL does support. We'll see it later on. Uh, then there's a few slides on integrity constraints. We already saw not null primary. Uh, there are a couple more, unique and check, uh, which I will cover quickly before the tea break. So unique simply says that a set of attributes are unique. That is, no two tuples can uh, have the same value for these, for all of these attributes. In other words, actually, this thing says that uh, the unique specification states that the attributes form a candidate key. Uh, but in reality, again, uh, this is what the SQL standard says. But in reality, there is no way for SQL to check if it is minimal. 
So, more realistically uh, the unique specification simply says it is a super key, but there is one difference between unique and primary key and that is in primary key values cannot be null whereas, in a set of attributes declared as unique the values can be null and SQL allows this. So, there are some several situations where you want to use unique without declaring it as a primary key. And the check constraint, uh, this is a very big slide, ignore everything down here, it is a definition of the table section, ignore everything and come right to the bottom, which says check semester in fall, winter, spring, summer. What is this check clause doing? Whenever you insert or update the section table, it will check that the value for semester is one of these four strings fall, winter, spring or summer. And if it is not one of these uh, integrity constraint violation will be raised and your insert or update statement will be rejected rolled back. So, why is this useful? Well, in this case the motivation is obvious. What is less obvious is why did we use check instead of using a uh, alternative of foreign key. So, for this case we could have had a semester uh, master which lists the possible semesters fall, winter, spring and summer are the four tuples in a semester master table. And here we could have said say create table section and semester where care 6 foreign key referencing semester master. That actually would have been in some sense cleaner because now I can add a new semester if I want to introduce semester. In fact, this happened in IIT. Um, because our MTech projects uh, were decided to not actually coincide with any semester, regular semester, they created a new semester just for MTech projects. Uh, nothing else uh, would happen in those semesters, those semesters overlapped existing semesters, etcetera, etcetera. So, uh, if that had to happen, we would have had to, with this approach, we would have had to go and insert new values into this list here. But in our schema, we simply added a new tuple to the semester master and that is it, nothing more needed to be done. So, uh, that alternative is actually better in some sense, but we kept it simple because we did not want more and more relation names in our schema. And the last topic before the tea break is are going to be cascading actions in referential integrity. A few people had been asking me about this already. We already saw foreign key references. Uh, in this case, course has a foreign key department name referencing department. Now, here is a small variant of this definition. First of all, we said department name where care 20 references department. We could take this specification and move it separately and say department name where care 20, and then we can say foreign key department name references department. That is so far it is exactly the same thing, this is a slightly different syntax. But now there is a little bit more, what we have said is on delete cascade, on update cascade. What is this? Supposing a department is deleted, the on delete cascade does what? It deletes all the courses associated with the department. Now, this is actually a very crazy thing to do, you do not really want to go delete all the courses in the department, you lose a lot of historical information. But if this is what you want to do, well SQL allows it and there are other cases where this is a very meaningful thing. If I delete an order for example, I want to delete all the uh, line items in the order. So, in order to understand this uh, you need a schema. So, let me use the whiteboard and explain that. We have a schema order, order number and then customer a bunch of stuff there. Now, we a particular order may have many items inside it, you know when I order uh, something from the grocery shop, I give a list of items. So, I am going to have an order item, which will have order number, line number, item uh, and other things, maybe how many uh, things I want how many packets, how many kgs, whatever other stuff can be in there. Now, if you see order number in order item is really a foreign key referencing order. 
But if I delete an order, I and mean, this does happen, you know, I decide to cancel order, I can go delete it. If I delete the order, I need to delete all the corresponding tuples from order item which reference that order. Otherwise, I have order items with no matching order. It makes no sense to retain them. So, in this case, it makes a lot of sense to use this clause which we just saw. And that clause was on delete cascade. It will go delete it. There is also an on update cascade. Supposing uh, I decide to change the department name. This has happened in IIT Bombay. Uh, I think our metallurgy department uh, changed at some point to metallurgical engineering and material science. Uh, so, maybe we want to change the department name and then everything that references the department name should get updated. Actually, I am lying a little bit. Uh, in our schema, we do not use the department name as a primary key. There is a department code because names are very long. So, we actually did not have to update anything. Uh, but if we had used department name as a primary key, then on update cascade would have been useful. And there are other alternatives on up, uh, update set null, on delete set null. So, if you want to delete the department but keep the course, we could say on delete set null and so forth. Okay, so, I think uh, I will stop here and maybe uh, take one or two questions and then wrap up the last few parts of chapter 4 after the break. Uh, so, I will take a few questions now. Uh, LRDP Gandhinagar, do you have a question? How can we drop foreign key? How can we drop foreign key when we, are, when we have not mentioned the uh, constraint name? How can you drop a foreign Means key? I do not want to drop the column. Yes, I do not want to drop the column, but I want to drop foreign key. Okay. So, the question is, how do you uh, drop a foreign key? And the SQL syntax lets you drop a foreign key by giving it, uh, giving the name of the foreign key. Now, uh, the SQL syntax also allows you to name all constraints. You can give a name to foreign key, primary key and other such constraints. So, if you give it a name, it is easy to go and say drop the constraint with that name. If you did not give it a name, what do you do? The database all automatically gives it a name. So, if you go browse the schema and using any tool for browsing the schema, you can find the constraints and you will find the names of those constraints. So, you can then go and say drop the constraint using that name which you just found. So, uh, when you use PG admin, uh, you will uh, be able to browse the schema and go try it out. You can also look at the uh, relation names, the attributes, the integrity constraints and so on. And even if you, you did not give it a name, the system will automatically give it a name and you can see the name when you browse it. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Second question is there, sir. Yeah. Sir, is there any practical application of updatable view? Is there a practical application of updatable view? Uh, yes. Uh, because I have no so, some of the views uh, which I showed which filter away information. Uh, might still uh, allow updates because maybe you want somebody to uh, be able to update, let us say your address, but not see your salary. So, maybe we will give a view to uh, whoever is allowed to change your address and that view does not include your salary, but they are allowed to update the view and change your address in there. So, there are uh, situations where this is useful, but I should mention that the uh, use of views for security. Uh, when the SQL standard was defined, uh, there was a lot of motivation for this, but there are issues uh, with uh, the way SQL databases are used these days. And I am going to come back to it at the end of chapter 4. So, I will discuss this just after the break. Any other question? Good morning, sir. So, yeah. this is related to uh, the uh, agent oriented paradigm. Do we have any tool uh, with the help of uh, it we can implement uh, this paradigm into the database system, sir? Which paradigm? Object? Agent oriented paradigm, agent like oriented. object relation. Agent oriented. No. Not is, sure what is you mean such by such kind agent? of database systems are available? Okay, I am not aware the of. The object relational mapping is there. Yeah. Okay, okay, sir. Thank so you. So, object relational mapping is standard nowadays. Uh, I, but if you want to implement it on your database, uh, you just use a tool, object relational mapping, let us say Hibernate. Uh, you, you can download Hibernate and uh, it sits outside of the database, it is a separate tool and you can uh, use it to 
uh, create the mapping first, you have to define the mapping and then you can write programs uh, which are linked to the Hibernate library and uh, you have to give the database connection information to the Hibernate configuration file and then when you run your program it calls the Hibernate library and uh, that talks to the database. So uh, using ORMs uh, is not very hard, can be done completely outside of the database. Uh, if people are interested, I can make information available about how to use Hibernate as part of the Moodle site. I think there was some other question of, uh, which I didn't quite follow, uh, but does, does this answer your question? You know, but yeah, but I have one more curiosity. Uh, this agent, uh, uh, sorry, object relational mapping yeah. can accelerate the, uh, the the moving of the data in the database means. Uh, uh, automation means we can automate the data with the help of this that another thing uh, is coming in my mind in, in terms of research uh, on yeah, this. I am not sure what you mean by uh, uh, you know uh, speed up data or whatever else word you use for that. No, so the point of object relational mapping systems is to make it easier to write application programs and to make your application database independent. These are the two motivating factors. Uh, the first motivating factor which is to make it easier to write applications was why they were created in the first place. Uh, the second factor which is database independence kind of happened and is today it is one of the motivating factors. Um, so that is the reason why they, it, uh, efficiency of execution was not one of the factors uh, which led to their creation. Uh, but in the end are they more efficient than writing SQL? Um, you know, I think the jury is out on it. Uh, there are some issues with parallelization and so on. Um, you know, maybe some things may be faster in using an ORM because it does caching, whereas a database does not do caching by default. Um, on the other hand, some things may be faster not using ORM, directly using the database. So I will just leave it at that. And uh, maybe we will take questions from one other center. Okay, we are seeing uh, MGM College of Engineering, Nandet. MGM, please go ahead. Hello, uh, my question is regarding object relational mapping again. So, can we use Hibernate query language instead of X query to map the objects of XML database? Yeah. So, uh, this is a question specific to Hibernate. Uh, so, Hibernate uh, gives you this mapping and hides the SQL schema from the programmer. So now if you want to write a query, what do you do? You could write a query by writing uh, nested loops and uh, iterating over objects, but that is horribly inefficient. So the Hibernate designers uh, developed a query language which uses the uh, class uh, model which is exposed to the Hibernate programmer, hiding the details of the underlying SQL implementation. So uh, that is something which people do use. Um, now the other part of the question is uh, research on this. Um, yeah, so there are certainly issues in how to implement uh, this Hibernate query language efficiently. The problem is, uh, you know, you can write things easily, which you may then have to translate to SQL and make sure the underlying database can execute the SQL query reasonably efficiently. Uh, so th those are issues in implementing the Hibernate query language. Um, so it could be an interesting uh, topic for research. I have not looked into it in too much detail, but yes, if you want to look at it, uh, by all means, how to do the translation could be, a, uh, and how to improve the thing. Obviously, they already have an implementation. Uh, the research angle would be how to make it better. So the last few topics from chapter four, after this we will move to chapter five, are on uh, integrity constraint violations, authorization and so on. So we already looked at integrity constraints. Now here is an interesting situation, slightly artificial, but it illustrates a potential problem. Supposing we have a table person and as attributes in that table, we have mother and father, which are IDs of persons who are the mother and the father. <coughs> so what happens here? We have a foreign key father represents person, foreign key mother represents person. Slightly artificial, but you can imagine uh, an employee situation where you have a manager which is a foreign key uh, referencing the person table itself. So it is a very similar situation. So now, how do we insert a person tuple 
without causing an integrity constraint violation. So, the way to do it in this case will be to insert people in the order of uh, their ancestry. So, first you before you insert a person you must insert their father or mother if you plan to set it. Now, both of these are foreign keys which can be set to null. So, another option is to initially insert tuples with father and mother set to null, insert all the tuples that you want in the database and then for those tuples which do have a valid father or mother value, you go back and update the tuples to set the values appropriately. Otherwise, what will happen is if you do things out of order, a person may have a father defined, but it is just that the father tuple was not inserted yet when you inserted this person tuple. So, if you sort the tuples, you can do it correctly or you set null initially and then insert all the tuples and then go back and patch all the tuples to set it correctly. But there is a third option which is useful in some contexts. In particular, when you have cyclic references, uh, neither of these uh, sorry, when you have cyclic references where you cannot set things to null, neither of these works. So, what do I mean by cyclic reference? Let us say we have a spouse relation spouse could be an id and two people are married to each other. Supposing I say that spouse cannot be null, we only allowed married people in this uh, club. So, spouse has to be present, we only allow couples in here. Therefore, for both people there must be a spouse value which is a foreign key referencing the uh, person table and we say that it cannot be null because we are insisting that the spouse be present. Again it is artificial, but it just illustrates a point. So, now what happens? If I want to insert the husband, I cannot do it because the wife is not yet inserted in the table and that uh, spouse value will not be present in the person table. If I try to insert the wife first, the husband's tuple is not yet inserted in the table. Therefore, the spouse value which is the husband's id will fail the foreign key reference. So, what whichever order I try to do it, it will fail and furthermore, if I say that the value cannot be null, then I am in big trouble. Neither of these two solutions works. So, SQL actually has a third solution, which is to defer integrity constraint checking, which is, um, so you can say set constraints and give the name of the constraints and make it deferred, which means it will not be checked at this point. But they all they are supposed to be checked at the end of a transaction. So, the idea is we start a transaction, we insert multiple tuples with the uh, uh, father, mother or spouse attribute set as we want, but the foreign key constraint is not checked at immediately, it is checked at the time you commit the transaction. So, initially I insert a, a say a husband tuple, the spouse value is not yet present in the database but it is not checked yet. Then I go ahead and insert the wife tuple and now the spouse attribute of the husband is correct and the spouse attribute of the wife is also correct because husband is already there. Uh, so, by postponing checking the constraint, it has become satisfied later and the point at which it is supposed to be checked is at the end of a transaction. So, that is what this slide is about, uh, the spouse constraint is in here. So, immediate means as soon as the update is made, deferred means at the time the transaction commits. There are also options provided by most databases to turn off constraint checking for a while regardless of transactions. You do a bunch of stuff and then go back and reimpose the constraint and it is checked at that time. Now, what happens is there is a violation, you have already inserted a bunch of tuples and you are trying to enforce a constraint, it is not satisfied because now maybe there is a person with an invalid spouse or invalid father or mother reference. So, at this point the best that can be done is to check which tuple and run a separate transaction to clean up the relation and then reinforce the uh, to enforce the uh, integrity constraints again. So, deferred means end of transaction, deactivate would be to turn it off for the near future. Now, there is another issue with check clauses, we saw that uh, time slot in uh, the section relation ideally ought to be a foreign key referencing the time slot relation, but it cannot because the time slot relation does not uh, has a primary key if you recall which has time slot id 
uh, day and ta start time. The three attributes together form the primary key of the time slot relation. But in the second relation, there is a time slot value, which ideally ought to be a foreign key, but it cannot because in SQL, a foreign key can only reference a primary key or anything which is unique. And uh, time slot is not unique in the time slot relation. So it will be nice if we can create a check like this. In the section relation, we have a check which says check time slot ID in select time slot ID from time slot. So how should this check work? It is actually not supported by any database system that I am aware of currently, uh, although it is technically part of the SQL standard. So how should it work if it works? So first of all, whenever I insert a tuple into the section relation, it should check that the time slot ID is present in uh, this sub query. If I update the time slot ID, it should check it. But here is the hard part. If I update the time slot relation and delete a, a time slot, then I will have to go back and check all the referencing tuples uh, to see if that uh, time slot ID was used. Because if it was, then that tuple is now violating the integrity constraint. That turns out to be expensive and that is the reason uh, no database supports this. Um, so it is unfortunately not supported. There are workarounds using triggers where you have to code a whole bunch of checks. So whatever checks I just told you, when I insert into a section, check this. When I update section, check it. When I delete from time slot, check it. All of these checks can be done through triggers and we will look at triggers in a little bit. And finally, the SQL standard had something called assertion which was even more general but nobody supports it so we won't talk about it. Now here are a few time related types in SQL. We had uh, date, time, timestamp. Each of these has its purpose. Date is when you do not want a time within the date, it's just the date. Time is when you want a time within the day but not the date. A timestamp which is a combination, date plus time of day. And the last uh, one in this list is interval which is a uh, time interval that is it is not saying that the time interval is between this time and that time. The time interval says 1 hour or 35 days or whatever. Now the obvious application of this is in uh, let us say fixed deposits in banks. So the fixed deposit interest depends on the time interval. It says 41 day is so much um, percentage. So what you would do is when you create a deposit if you say um, and this is the interval you want to represent that in the database as an interval 41 days and then add the 41 day interval to today to get the expiry date of the fixed deposit. So that is where the interval comes. Note that 41 days cannot be represented as a date because the date is a particular date. Today is a date. Today plus 41 days is a date but 41 days gap is an interval. Of course the interval could be uh, at uh, units of a day or even more a fine grain hour, minute, second, millisecond, whatever you want. So here is a small uh, quiz question. Uh, there is an expression. So the question is date plus date some value minus date some other value. By the way, this is the SQL syntax for saying that uh, something is a date. How do you specify it's a date value? You have the keyword date followed by a string containing the date. And the default is year, year, uh, four uh, characters for year, hyphen, two characters for month, hyphen, two characters for day. So what does this, this expression do? Date minus another date. What is the type of uh, this result when you subtract one date from another? It is an interval. We just discussed the interval type. Now what is the result of adding an interval to a date? It is a date. So the result of this is a date and it is valid. On the other hand, supposing I did the following. Instead of minus here, I put plus. Would it be valid? What sense does it make to add one date to another? It is completely meaningless. That would be a type error and the system would reject it if I said plus. Okay, so the correct answer was A which is uh, 1 which is valid and returns a date. So the next very small topic is on index creation. What is an index? You have used indices at the back of a book which given a word you can find out which page that word is defined or used in. 
an index for a database is given a value, you can find which tuple has that value in a specified attribute. So, an example of a query select star from student where id equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, it is a very common query, we look up student by id number. If you have to scan the whole student relation and look at every tuple to check if id is equal to this, it will take forever. So, what we want is an index which lets us very quickly find which tuple has value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, the SQL standard does not talk much about it, but all databases do have a syntax which looks more or less like this. Create index, you can give it a name, on relation name and then list of attributes. And usually you can give more options after this to say what the type of the index is and other parameters to it, uh, which are database specific. Uh, so, we will come back to indices when we cover internals. So, for the moment, uh, this is all you need to know about indices. Uh, there are a few more types, large object types to store things like photos and uh, text which is larger than. Uh, so, most databases will allow you wear care up to some limit, few thousand kilobytes. Beyond that, they will not allow wear care, but they will allow a C lob object uh, which can be much larger. Uh, then you can have B lob for image. Movie B lob 2 gigabytes is actually very optimistic in the following sense. Um, most databases prefer not to have very large objects inside of the database, and this is for some practical reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that database dump and restore becomes very slow if you have too much or too, too very large images inside it. And typically, things like movies really do not need database features. Why on earth would you want recovery and concurrency control on a movie? Makes no sense. So, the typical way in which this is handled is to store uh, movies or large images in a file system, not in a database. And in the database, you store a file name, so that you can access that movie or the image um, from your database application. So, you store the file name, but you do not have to store the actual data in the database. In fact, uh, some uh, database systems which are integrated with the OS. Uh, can actually prevent you from deleting the file, uh, you know, without the database knowing and uh, vice versa, prevent you from creating a file name without the file existing. So, uh, there are uh, database uh, file system integration systems which some databases provide. The last topic in this chapter is authorization, I have been hinting at this. So, uh, authorization gives privileges. Uh, to users and the grant statement is used for this. The, the general syntax is grant a list of privileges on relation of view name to user list, where the user list can be a user ID uh, or it could be public which means everybody or there is something called a role, we will come to it in just a moment. Now, it is worth noting that granting a privilege on a view, like if I grant read on a view, that does not mean I am granting read on the underlying relation. This is important for security. I said that we create a view and make the view accessible to somebody, but not the original relation. So, granting read on a view does not imply granting read on the underlying relation. And the person who does the grant, somebody has to execute this statement. Typically, it would be the owner of that item, the person who created the item or uh, the database administrator, uh, but in more generally um, you must have the privilege that you are granting and the right to grant, I will come back to it. So, what are the privileges? There is a select privilege which allows you to read. For example, grant select on instructor to these three users, u1, u2 and u3, they are some user IDs. Insert the ability to insert tuples, update the ability to update a tuple, delete similarly the ability to delete and all privileges means anything, select, insert, update, delete. Now, you can also revoke a privilege which was granted. So, revoke privilege list on relation of view name from user list, this is the general syntax. So, uh, this says revoke select on branch, well branch is from our old schema, this is a bug. Uh, think of this as the, on the previous slide I think we had instructor, right, yeah instructor. So, revoke select on instructor from these three guys. You can also say revoke all from this list of guys, which means we are revoking all privileges uh, from these guys. 
So, revoke all on branch uh, on instructor from these guys. And if you say revoke something from public, what happens? Supposing I have granted some privileges to public and then I also grant it specifically to a user. This user has this privilege in two ways. One, because this user is also part of public, public is everyone and two, because it was granted explicitly to them. Now, supposing I revoke the same privilege from public. In the SQL definition, these users who are explicitly granted the privilege will continue to retain them. Revoke from public does not mean revoke from these guys also. Even though they get it twice, you are revoking one of which is the public. The other one is still there. It's not been deleted. So, they can still keep a privilege. In fact, uh, there are some other complications that I do not want to get into. Now, among the interesting privileges, we, we saw a bunch, but there is one more kind of privilege, which is called the reference privilege. The reference privilege gives you the ability to create a foreign key referencing a relation. Now, why is this relevant? So, here is an example. Grant reference on uh, reference and then the attribute name, department name on department to some user. What is the need for this? This allows the user to create a table with a foreign key referencing department, name of department. Okay. So, if I just say foreign key referencing department, assuming department name is a primary key, this is default. But if you had declared this unique, uh, then I can actually say foreign key uh, references department, open parenthesis department name. So, if you do not want it referencing the primary key, you want it referencing some other attribute, you can do that explicitly as long as it has been declared as unique. So, anyway coming back, um, unless a user has this privilege, they cannot create a foreign key referencing department. Now, why is that? That is because the moment this user has created a foreign key, the person who owns the department table can no longer delete a department arbitrarily. Supposing uh, this guy Mariano creates a table referencing the CS department. Now, I own the department table and I want to delete the CS department. I cannot because there is a, another table which has a reference to the CS department and deleting CS will violate the foreign key constraint there. So, if I allow anyone to arbitrarily create references, I am in trouble. So, I need a to grant a privilege to someone, only then they can create a foreign key referencing name. Now, you do not see this much because in your assignments, you just have one user who is creating the tables, uh, all the tables owned by that user. So, you already have all privileges on all your tables. But if you access some other users tables, then these things are important. Uh, you can also um, do various other things. You can grant a privilege to somebody with grant option, which means they in turn can grant that privilege to somebody else. Uh, you can revoke a privilege from this guy cascade. What this cascade means is, if you had granted it to Amit with grant option, Amit in turn had granted select on department to somebody else. When you say revoke cascade, not only is the privilege withdrawn from Amit, but it is also withdrawn from anyone that Amit granted it to. So, recursively it is withdrawn. On the other hand, if you say restrict, if Amit had granted it to somebody, then this uh, revoke will actually fail um, and you have to first make Amit withdraw the grants and then you can revoke it from Amit. Anyway, these are minor details. Uh, with that, we end chapter 4. Uh, this is a good time to take a few questions. Okay, Mar Basilios. Hello, sir. Kerala. Please go ahead and ask your question. Sir, my question is regarding on views. So, can we create an index on view? Can we create an index of view? So, can first of all, if it is a normal view, it has no data. So, you cannot index a view which does not have any data. However, if you are using SQL Server, SQL Server uh, you know takes this thing. If you say create index on a view, SQL Server takes that to mean that you want the view result to be materialized. That is, you compute and store the result of the view 
and build the index on it. And then subsequently, SQL Server will uh, keep the view up to date. Whenever you update a relation uh, which is used in the view, the view result which, are, which it has computed will get updated immediately. So, uh, creating an index on a view is a SQL Server feature. I do not know if others allow it and if so, what they do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, one more question is there. Hmm. Sir, can we do the operations like join on views? Like join on views? Yes. Views can be used in a query anywhere you want. You can do joins, you can do aggregates, you can do anything to it. In any uh, place where a relation could appear in a query, you can use a view. No restrictions at all. Except for update. In a query which does not do any updates, the, you can use a view anywhere. Any other question? Okay, thank you, sir. Sona sure. College, Salem. Please go ahead. Hello, uh, sir. Uh, we have a doubt from yesterday's class. Okay. Uh, you wrote a query using join yesterday. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between this natural join and join? And in which case should we go for natural join instead of join? Okay. So, join and natural join are essentially the same thing, except uh, that you know you can always take a natural join and rewrite it using a regular join. Whatever columns are common, so let me use the whiteboard to explain that. Many people have this question, so I think it is worth explaining. So, let us say I have a select, I will do it in the context of SQL, um, something star from R natural join. Yes. So, let us take R to be of with a schema A B and S to have the schema B C for simplicity. So, R natural join S could equally be written as select and that star I will fill in in just a moment from R comma S where R dot B equal to S dot B. And now, why did I leave these? Uh, select things columns empty, I am going to fill it in now, r dot a, r dot b. Now, I am not going to include s dot b, because it is uh, the if, if to make something which is equivalent to the natural join, in the natural join the schema output is a, b, c, b does not appear twice. So, I will have to use s dot c, so that it has the same schema a, b, c. These two are exactly the same. So, a natural join can always be rewritten using an ordinary join. The question is, when should you use one versus the other? It is a convenience. So, in some of the queries which we had, we had uh, foreign keys and primary keys with many attributes. So, writing out a uh, long join condition equating every one of them is uh, kind of uh, tiresome. So, using a natural join or using a join using so equivalently. This is actually equivalent to I hope you uh, saw the whiteboard and got an idea of the different ways of writing the query, which are all equal. Now, how do you choose between these? It is a matter of taste and uh, the natural join or the using uh, is easier if you have a join on many attributes. So, for our uh, university schema, we have to sometimes join on four different attributes. Section has the uh, section ID, course ID, years and so, their join using is very convenient rather than the other form, but it depends on your application and on your taste. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Let us move to another center now. Okay. We are with Loyola Chennai. Please go ahead, Loyola. First of all, to introduction myself, uh, I am Bob, working as a senior lecturer in St. Peter University. 
So I am asking in three questions. The first one, does the SQL view exist if the table is dropped from the database? First question. Second question, can you update the data using the view? It be updating to the original table. The second question. And third question, what is R and data? Okay. Let's start with the first thing that was, uh, can you have a view and then drop the table uh, which is used in the view definition? Now obviously if you use this view subsequently, uh, it's going to give you an error uh, saying that uh, the table is not available. Now is this checked at the time you drop the table? Uh, I don't think so. Most databases I think don't actually check it immediately. But when the view gets used, at that point uh, an error is detected that the table no longer exists. So that's uh, the answer to your first question. Uh, the second question was, can we update it the data using views? So for that, the answer is uh, something which I discussed in a uh, lot of detail earlier today, which is uh, certain updates on views can be translated, others cannot. And most SQL systems will restrict updates to views. Uh, it will allow it only on views which are very simple. They should be select views with a uh, few more conditions uh, which I had on a slide. So go, you can go back and look at the slides for this chapter. And it gives the typical kind of conditions uh, under which a view update is allowed by many database implementations. Some may not apply, allow it on any views. Others may allow it on a slightly bigger class of views. But what I have given you is fairly typical. And the last part is orphan data. Um, in general, orphan data would mean uh, uh, like uh, master, uh, 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 you know, uh, data like the order and line item, uh, which I used in the example earlier today, that I have an orders relation. Each order has multiple lines in that order. Uh, so that's in a line item table. So if there is a record in the line item table with an order number, which doesn't exist in the order table, it's meaningless without the order. So that would be orphan data. And the uh, foreign key constraint with, uh, ensures that the orphan data cannot happen. And the on delete uh, cascade ensures that you can actually delete the order without explicitly going and deleting the individual items. Uh, does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Okay. Sri Narayana Gurukulam mm -hmm. College, Kerala. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, we have one question regarding uh, view. So the, so the one question is, uh, sir, can we, can we create a, a new view uh, from an already established queue view? Yeah, so in the view examples I showed, uh, you can uh, define one view in, in using another view relation. So you can uh, create a whole hierarchy of these. View A can be defined using view B. Uh, view B can be defined using view C and so on. That's absolutely fine. There's no restriction on that. Does that answer your question or? Okay, thank you, sir. So one more question. Uh, so uh, one uh, different question uh, regarding uh, the query. Uh, so when, while we are using uh, count distinct uh, on a particular attribute, sir, uh, sir, is there any relationship, any difference between uh, using in uh, Oracle and uh, PostgreSQL? On count distinct? Uh, no, the count distinct is part of the SQL standard. And as far as I know, uh, Oracle and PostgreSQL implement it in the same way. So I don't think there should be any difference on, on this particular aspect. There are other differences, but this particular thing, I don't think there's any difference. Oh, okay, sir. So one more thing. Uh, so while we are using a describe uh, a particular table, you know, like uh, while, while we are using it in PostgreSQL, it is not running any result. Like they're showing that it's an error like that. DEC query, that particular keyword is not working in PostgreSQL. Yeah. So DAC is, uh, describe is an Oracle specific thing. Uh, it's not part of the SQL standard. PostgreSQL has an equivalent command slash D. If you run it from uh, post from the PSQL uh, command prompt. But if you want to use, uh, you know, what I would suggest is most of the time uh, you might as well use a GUI, PG admin or some other GUI. Oracle has its own, uh, I think, SQL uh, developer. Or so. There are other GUIs stored for Oracle and so on. So if you're using those, it's actually easier to just uh, browse the schema, double click on the relation name and get the information that you want without having to type this. So if you use PG admin, uh, you can do that. If you're using PSQL, instead of describe, you can say backslash D and 
then table name it will show you the uh, schema of that table does that answer your question yeah yes yeah, thank you sir terna please go ahead uh, hello sir uh, i had a question uh, this is regarding the earlier discussion on orm um, you had mentioned sir uh, that in hibernate that we can have uh, the queries we are not having access to uh, like it is the queries are created by hibernate and uh, they are fired directly by hibernate but in an application if you are facing some problem uh, is there a way of tweaking the queries is can we access the queries which hibernate is directly firing or uh, is 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 there a way of uh, tweaking those queries it for testing okay. so what hibernate provides is a way to specify a mapping between your java uh, class and the underlying relational database so you can provide this mapping in a configuration file and after that hibernate generates a sql you can't tweak it without going and changing the hibernate code as far as i know uh, so the mapping is described thus so you can have uh, you know different uh, relational schemas uh, which can be mapped to the same um, java uh, classes for example uh, so as as an example of the kinds of things you can do in the uh, java side you can have uh, let's say a, a student object and along with the student object you can have a collection of courses that the student has done okay so that's a collection object now in the relational database it's actually been normalized to uh, the student relation and the takes relation so it's possible to specify the mapping such that when i create the student object the sql query also goes to the takes relation and fills in the uh, collection which is accessible in hibernate so you, you can control some of these things and uh, then hibernate will fetch the relevant will issue an sql query to fetch the relevant data and populate the collection thank you sir thank you sir there's a uh, one more question sir okay. uh, this is regarding views uh, so where is the view exactly stored in the database like how it is different from tables where is it stored sir okay. so uh, tables including views uh, have two parts there is a metadata about the table which includes things like uh, you know what are the columns or attributes of the table what are the types of the attributes what are the constraints on the table and so on all of this is stored as uh, part of what is called the data dictionary so this is all the it's also called the metadata let me use the whiteboard so these are two terms uh, which are relevant here the data dictionary is uh, actually it's a set of relations in the database which keep track of what all tables there are what are their attribute names types and constraints and so forth all of this data is also called metadata because it is data about data so now when you create a view the name of the view uh, the types uh, the attributes and the types of the attributes of the view and the actual sql query defining the view are all stored in the data dictionary okay so there is actually a table in the data dictionary which records what all views there are and what are their definitions and the types of their attributes uh, just like as there are also tables in the data dictionary which record what are all the tables in the database and what are their attribute types and constraints and so forth so all of this is part of the data dictionary thank you sir okay good so now let me uh, take a few minutes to uh, cover some queries which i wanted to cover as part of chapter 4 but didn't uh, include in the slides so uh, yesterday we saw a query which was to find for each department get the department name and the number of uh, or this uh, let's say the num number of instructors in that department so one way to write the query which we saw was select department name count star from instructor
group by department name. So, this is one query we saw. And we saw that there is a problem with this query in case there is a department with no instructor because it will not appear in the output. So, what do we do about it? One of the alternatives we saw was uh, to use a sub query. What did we do? We said select department name, comma, and then there is a sub query in the select clause select count star from instructor where let us give it, uh, let us call this uh, instructor i, uh, where i dot department name equal to, and I am going to have a d over here, from department d. So, coming back here, where i dot department name equal to d dot department name. So, this a uh, query which had a scalar subquery in the select clause will give a count 0 for every department which has no instructors at all. So, now uh, this is a one way of writing it. There is actually one more way of writing it using outer join. So, our goal is to do the following. So, I will come back to the select statement from department left outer join instructor on uh, again I will just give it names department D instructor I where on D dot depth name equal to I dot department name. Okay. So, this is the left outer join, which is going to preserve departments even if they have no instructor. Now, I can do the following. I can say group by department name and here select department name comma count. Now, here I have to do something uh, little different. So, I am going to say count of i d, this i d is coming from the instructor. So, what is this variant of the query do? The outer join is going to have some departments which do not have any instructors. The outer join result will have the department present, but the i d attribute in this outer join will be null for such departments. There will be only one tuple with the instructor id attribute being null. Whereas, for departments which do actually have instructors, the department will up appear uh, will join with each such instructor and there will be many rows here. Now, when I do group by department name, departments with no instructors will also show up with id being null. So, now count of id what does it do? Uh, the id is null in this case, there is only one tuple in the group for that department with id null. And as I said, for aggregates, the null values are discarded. So, what do we get? We get an empty set and count of an empty set, as I said, is special. It gives 0. So, you will get that department name with count 0. So, this is alternative way of writing that query using outer join. So, outer join can be quite useful in such situations to make sure that you do not lose uh, certain fields. Uh, so, it is not only useful for regular join, it is also useful for uh, aggregates to make sure that you do not lose data. You can always use scalar subqueries, but this is an alternative which is quite useful in many cases. And the last point I want to make is many people tend to make this mistake. Uh, forget this part of it, just take the outer join query here, this part of the query, okay. So, outer join. Some people make the mistake of writing it like this. Select something, let us not worry about that now, from department D left outer join 
instructor i, where d dot department name equal to i dot department name. Okay. Think about this query for a moment. What does it do? It is doing a left outer join without any condition, which means every department tuple will match with every instructor tuple and it is actually totally meaningless. So, fine, first it matches everything. So, this part the left outer join is essentially a Cartesian product uh, with the only thing that if department uh, sorry instructor relation itself is empty, all the departments will still appear. Uh, they would not appear in a Cartesian product, but here they would appear. So, it is almost the same as a Cartesian product. After that, you apply this condition d dot department name equal to i dot department name. And now, what is going to happen is if a department had no instructor, um, you know, it would be matched with every other department and all the uh, sorry, it will be matched with every instructor, but all of those matches will get filtered and in the end, the department is actually removed by this join condition. This is not going to give any tuple for a department with no instructor. That department will be eliminated. So, this is actually a completely meaningless query. It is not the same as this. It is a completely idiotic query. Do not use it. So, the moral is when I do an outer join, I can use a natural outer join, that is fine. If I use left outer join, I need an on clause here with an appropriate condition, and that condition should not be replicated in the where clause. If you put it in a where clause, um, you know, i dot department name would have been null if d has no matching instructor, and then such tuple will get filtered out, and the net result will be a regular join, not an outer join. So, do not use this. Uh, the reason I mentioned this is that we had given some query in our assignment, and several students gave the second form instead of the first form. And what is more surprising is that some TAs missed this and marked it correct. They were correcting in a hurry and did not notice that this condition was not in the on clause, it was in the where clause. So, this is an easy mistake to make, you should be aware of it. Okay, so, that is it for outer joints.